and welcome to another edition, episode number 30 of the Lab Epstein Mini Podcast. I'm Jim. Joining me as always, I'm not looking at my sheet, by the way, uh, wow. renowned hitting instructor, professional evaluator, former coach, friend, co-host Jake Epstein in his uh, Texas abode today. Hey, what's going on? <laughs> the Texas abode. I'm, I'm impressed you don't have to read your your intro anymore. That's, that's impressive. And this is our 465th episode. Episode 30. Or, or 30. Not that it feels like 465. Yeah, you're, you're lying. It does feel like that, doesn't it, for you? <laughs> <laughs> Not for me. It's invigorating. Um, I have a bone to pick with you, by the way. I was going to do it off oh. air, but I'll do it on air. Great. I was waiting for a an invite to the Masters little tournament that you said that we, you would invite me to, and I didn't. I didn't get. I didn't get invited to that tournament, and uh, I, I would like you to please explain to the audience as to why you wouldn't want to invite your friend Jim to the tournament. I'd probably win. That's probably why. Yeah, we don't like first timers. First timers always win. Uh, right. No, I actually was going to invite you, and then. I remember you explicitly telling me how you don't know anything about, like, golfers. That's not like, true. you don't watch golf. I, I watch some golf. I know a little you, bit about golf. You do? Okay. I just so don't, I, I, I don't follow it as much as I do my fantasy team or my sports betting in football and hockey and basketball. Okay. But well, I do watch bad. golf. Don't worry. Okay. I've seen, I saw that shot that went skipping right over the lake this week. Pretty impressive. Yeah. Do you Pretty shoot impressive. like that? Um, not on purpose. Okay. On, I, yeah, Usually when it, it goes into the lake and sinks, what happens by yeah. the way, when that happens? So what do you do? Do you just grab another ball and say, okay, you know, and just throw See, it on the course? Bogus. I don't know. What you do you have do? a couple options. So if you hit a ball in the water, you have to know where the ball entered the water. Okay. So if it entered the water, like turning left, like if you hit a slice being left-handed, yeah. Wherever that ball enters, there's always a boundary line in front of it and all the way around the water. So wherever ah. it go wherever it enters. So if you, for instance, if if he hit that ball across the water mm-hmm. and it didn't make it to the other side, okay, he would have to hit it right at the edge. He has a club length or two club lengths, is it one or two, from the edge of the water where it went in. Okay, no closer to the hole. So he yeah. he, he has to go in, but. If he skips it across the pond yeah. and it goes past the, you know, whatever, the barrier on the other side, the, the, uh, the hazard line, but it trickles back in the water, he can actually drop on the other side of the water. Okay. So, so what, if, what do you prefer then? Let's say you, oh, you hit it in the Not hitting it in the water. Right, but what, what if you do? Like, oh, shit, I hit it in the water. Which side do you prefer? You, you want to be closer. You want to be closer to yeah, the you'd, green on the other side. To, yes, you'd like to make it over that. So if you now if you hit a hook and it goes on the into the crosses that barrier in the side of the water, then you can cross, you know, maybe another fifty yards closer to the hole. So next, for water, it always depends on where it goes in. Next June we're gonna talk about some tennis too, because that's when the US Open goes on and happens. Yeah, let's talk about tennis. That was a tradition with my grandfather who loved tennis. All of his daughters, my mom included, played tennis. My mom was a college tennis player. I guess that's the right term. Yeah. She loves tennis. I like watching tennis with her. And it's a great sport. So now we're talking it is golf. A good sport. We'll we'll talk yeah. about tennis next uh, when the US Open comes around next year. Okay, we can start a pool on that one too. Right, and you won't invite me again. <laughs> you know, I'll invite you next time. Every every mass uh, not every masters, every major. This is the last major. Uh, the audience gotta, might be we got we got to wait until next April. The audience might be wondering this. Are you in any fantasy football leagues? No, too time consuming. Too time consuming. Okay. Yeah, I don't have time for that. You don't have time for fantasy football. No. Are you sure? No. And I'm I'm not saying you're not busy, but yeah. fantasy football is. Pretty, pretty, I figure. I, I feel like if I go in, if I if I put one toe in the water with fantasy football, I'm done. Yeah. Have you ever like done I'm fantasy baseball? In. No. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't suggest doing it. It's really boring. Yeah. And you okay. got to keep up every single day with the lineups, and yeah, ain't nobody got time for that. No, I saw a quote um, from Willie Mays this week on Twitter. It was from Baseball Quotes at Baseball Quotes on Twitter. By the way, I think I'm going to get a Parlor uh, app now too. That's what all the new the cool kids are doing too. <laughs> so I'm going to get a Twitter. I'm going to have a Twitter and a Parlor. I might get a Parlor. 
very soon. Let me know how that goes. I will. I'll probably have like two followers. Um, Willie was uh, quoted in saying, uh, in order to excel, you must completely be dedicated to your chosen sport, and you must also be prepared to work hard and willing to accept constructive criticism. Without 100% dedication, you won't be able to do this, meaning baseball. Now, I bring that up because we have a lot of kids listening. I have statistics on every age group that listens, all the analytics on which country. By the way, we have listeners now in Sweden. So hello to our Sweden friends. Yes. But uh, the all those analytics tell me that there's – plenty of kids listening that are under 18 mm-hmm. and a lot of that age i encourage everybody to play as many sports as possible i'm sure you did in high school mm-hmm. i did as well mm-hmm. uh, so i don't completely uh, i love willie mays obviously a legend but i don't think that's the greatest quote for um for kids to see because i think you should play all different sports and i'm sure you preach that too to your younger kids at at, at um at the lab yeah, you do, but you pour yourself into anything that you're doing. So I think that quote can be used for life in general, mm-hmm. right? Exactly. I mean, yeah. dedicate yourself to, you know, if you want to be a great basketball player, dedicate yourself. And even if it's for three months, right, dedicate mm-hmm. yourself to that sport or dedicate yourself to that project you're doing in school or dedicate yourself to, you know, a new business venture or the job that you're doing. So I, I think I think that quote is, yeah, I, I understand what what you're saying and what, And what he's saying, because he's saying it as a grown man, that, you know, that's what he did. He he played stickball and he played, you know, he may have played basketball there. You know, baseball was kind of all there was then. You know, I mean, people, football wasn't, wasn't really a big thing. So, you know, I think you, you could, you pour yourself into something, you're, you're going to be great at it. And you need people to tell you that you're, you're wrong. You need people to tell you that you did something wrong and you're bad. And hopefully people just don't say that and they, they, have, they have no reason for saying that. But, uh, you know, I watch the show Billions. You watch the show Billions? I don't. Love the show Billions. What right? channel's on? Uh, I think it's a Showtime show. It's probably on Netflix now. Okay. Anyway, um, so is a hedge fund guy. Brilliant, brilliant man, right? But he has a guy that keeps him in line. You know, and you have to have that person that says, you know what, or he actually has a psychiatrist too that keeps him in line. But he has, you know, two or three people that say that is a bad idea. Otherwise, you, you know, you go crazy. You need that criticism to keep you sharp. And sometimes that's a hitting instructor or a pitching coach or a tennis coach or whoever it is, but you need someone to keep you honest. Well, I'm going to segue into something. Um, Kim, um, I can't say her last name, uh, was hired. Uh, Kim Nying, or I apologize, I can't yeah, say her last name. I, I, couldn't find, I couldn't find a pronunciation this week. Um, but she was just hired as the Marlins head of baseball mm-hmm. operations. And you're, you're talking about keeping some players in line and, and keeping always being kept in line when you're great at something, just to keep mm-hmm. things in check and, and perspective. And I think this is a great hire. Because a lot of times, I think something that's rampant right now in front offices, and you, you know this pretty well also, is that there's a lot of infighting with, well, let's – analytics versus scouts or scouts versus player development or analytics versus player development without a real central true figure. And that's not taking away anything away from what general managers do in the game of baseball today. But they, at times, seem to lean one way or the other, whether it be analytics or more so on scouting or more so on, on player development, depending on, too, the way the wind is blowing with the organization in that given time, in that organization cycle. Where I think with Kim, just reading her resume, it seems like she's been in all sorts of different places, and she may be able to add fresh eyes and levity to any situation in the Marlins front office and give people a different perspective without having that um, I guess having that lean one way or the other. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, it's it's just going back to what you were saying about keeping things in check, and and I think it, seeing her getting hired, while it is a a barrier that's broken, yes, um, it's also something too that that may provide a, a just a different, fresh perspective on things. In my, yeah, it's it's great that she's a woman, but she's an ultra qualified, you know, right? Qualified yeah. person, yeah. like of she's. She's been around it. And, and, you know, again, the more you can lean on other people and learn from other people, doesn't mean you copy other people. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you're going to do or make the same mistakes they made, but the more you can kind of be exposed to that, 
I think is, is huge, especially when you can bring those two together. I and mean, I'm sure there is some kind of lean one way or the other. I think that, yeah. you know, yeah. that, that balance board does shift, but yeah, I'm, I, it is interesting. You know, you look at, um, you know, different organizations and, and there are so many like general managers that are, you know, being hired and considered for different jobs. And, and that person making the decision to hire them is, is, you know, they're looking at that. Is this more of a player development general manager, assistant GM or whatever it is, or is that, you know, or assistant vice president that they're giving a job to, or are they more data heavy mm-hmm. or who has the perfect combination of both? And that's the decision that these president of baseball operation team presidents are, are having to make right now. Let me, so let me ask you a question. If you're hiring a general manager or a head of baseball operations, I may know which way you're leaning. But if you're looking, like say, for example, the Angels, congratulations, by the way, uh, not only to Kim, but also to Perry um, Manassian. I hope I said that name right. Mm-hmm. And no pronunciations. But um, the Maniacin? Angels, I think it's Maniacin. Maniacin, okay. Yeah. And same, well, the I Mets think his are, dad or somebody else with that name, somebody in his family, I think. Well, the Mets are looking for a new GM as well. Uh, if you, and if you're right. Steve Cohen or, or Sandy Alderson in this case, um, play the role of them for a second. What are you looking for in a, in a general manager? I, I, it's tough, again, to get centered, to find somebody who's centered, male or female, but without leaning one way or the other. So that's an inevitable factor it in is. hiring. So what are, you, what are you kind of looking for in a new GM if you were in that position to hire somebody? You're, <laughs> Tough you're question, for, but it, I know. It's no, you're looking for someone who can lean across the aisle, right? You're yeah. you're looking for someone who can who can make decisions on uh, in both those areas, or hire the right people mm-hmm. in both of those areas. So I'm hiring a general manager that can lead, yeah, right. Somebody that can have a conversation with my analytics team, but can have a conversation after a game with my manager, right? You know, to have I remember Bochi and Kevin Towers had like the greatest relationship. Yeah, you know yeah. where they could they could say this is wrong, this is wrong, but you have to be able to have relationships and not get your feelings hurt with whoever is underneath you. So I think if you have a selfless general manager who can bring in people to be his assistant GMs that are heavy on one side, heavy on scouting, and one yeah. person heavy on analytics, and then have that open conversation, I think those are the best people. If you have a GM that's heavy one way going in then he's going to hire people underneath him that are heavy that way too. And he's going to hire a a manager. And then that manager is going to hire a coaching staff. And now all of a sudden you have an entirely metric forward um, staff or system. That's, that's a scary. Maybe that's good. I mean, but maybe that's, maybe that's what the Rays did. Yeah, but that's the but that's the scary part when you're just, when you're leaning, that's the right way you're leaning too far one way and you're, and you're hiring people that are more like-minded like you. That's right. And I don't believe that that works in any corporation. I, don't think, so. I think there has to be different, obviously different perspective on perspective on things, but you're right. You're saying being a leader and being able to reach across the aisle and understand different, just understand what's going on in different departments to where you can lend your hand and, and lead in that direction. Yeah. Because I would want as a GM, I would want huge player development. Right. Like that's be huge player development. I want to give everything I can to the player development. I think that like, for instance, the Dodgers, and it's not just instruction player development, it's feeding them. Right. Right. You know, giving them a, you know, a habitat for, for success at the minor league level, instead of, you know, a gross locker room and, and peanut butter sandwiches, you know, giving them the right tools to succeed. So player development heavy, maybe the minor league system, and then maybe advanced scouting, you know, maybe we're more analytical at the higher levels, like for, for our games and our shifts and maybe how we pitch. The free agents. Um, who look, try yeah, to right. Certain things with free agents, yeah. Yeah, so I, but I think if you don't have a good farm system, you're not going to be successful. It's just right. that simple. Like you have to be able to build. Now, whether those players in the farm system are going to be yours, whether they're going to hit the field, and be successful for your team. Like the Dodgers have brought great players up to their minor league system, right. but they also had players to trade for bets. Yeah. And they, and un- they uncovered Chris Taylor from, from San Diego to trade it for him. And then mm-hmm. look how he turned out. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned advanced scouting here. How would you combine? Would How would you combine? Are, are you talking about, cause some advanced scouts don't even go on the road anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, do you, are, are, are you, to. 
are you right? Are you saying sure. advanced scouts are still going on the road? What, how does that role change? Because I'm all for still having advanced scouting. Advanced scouting, in fact, saved the Nationals in 2019, from what I read in, the, in that World mm-hmm. Series. It saved Strasburg in uh, what game was it? Game six, whatever it was. Um, so how does that role change, combining that with analytics? Uh, what's the job description look like? Do you have to be well-versed in analytics, or can you understand the outer parts of analytics while still being able to do your job as an advanced scout? Yeah, I think the advanced scouts are are getting a feel for, you know, what are these players like right now? Right. You know, how do they look in the box? How do they, you know, if I'm scouting opposing hitters, you know, do they look jumpy? Do they look comfortable? Are they – are they the dude right now? Like, is that, who are we going to stay away from? You can look at stats and sometimes stats can be misleading, but if you watch a team play, you can kind of figure out who's hot and who's not. And, and, and no meaning advanced scouts are going to the, the town for the next series, right? Mm-hmm. They're in town for the next series. They're not, we're not talking about a month in advance. So, and then those same advanced scouts can do their work, but they can also go on the road and find, Hey, this would be a good guy to pick up. Like we need a utility man or we need a long reliever. We need somebody else. So I think advanced scouts need to be there in person. So you kind of, I think you might have answered it right there, but what is, I know people are going to, I have an idea, but, but for the audience, I know people probably will be wondering this. And I think there's just a keen interest on, on what scouts and, and what front office personnel do just in every sport across the, the board. What is the role? in advanced scouting what do they do because it's a very broad term it's not just scouting the opponent it's like you mentioned right there scouting players that could be picked up at the trade deadline depending on where your organization is so what is that role as an advanced yeah it it, it can be it can be you know i'm an advanced scout for the texas rangers and we're going to go in and and we're going to play uh we're going to play the royals Mm -hmm. next next series so i'm going to go to kansas city ahead of the team and watch the Kansas City three or four games set against, you know, whoever they're playing, you know, right. they're playing the Angels or whatever. So I'm going to get an idea of, of what, you know, how that feel is, how they're managing games, how they're managing their bullpen, um, the matchups, you know, left-handed, right-handed matchups coming out of the pen so we can prepare our guys for that. Maybe we take that advanced scouting and say, okay, the – you know, we know that, uh, you know, Gallo, you're going to face this guy, this guy, this guy, all series coming out of the pen after the sixth inning. So maybe we, we have Gallo, you know, hit off this machine that mm-hmm. is, you know, absolutely, you know, dialed in off this left-handed guy's slider so he can see a couple hundred of those before the series starts, you know, something like that. So that could be the, the level of advanced scouting coming forward. But you could also send these guys out um, to minor leagues, you know, to figure out, I mean, player to be named later yeah. guys we need in the minor leagues, you know, this, maybe this guy's been in the, in a different system for four or five years. He's, you know, been on the 40 man a couple times, but you know, he's going to be a rule five guy. Can we sneak in? Do we feel like we can make this guy better? Would he be a better fit in our organization versus theirs? Maybe we sign him when he gets released, or maybe he's a player to be named later, or maybe we just do a straight trade for them. So, I mean, these guys are like the octopus that have their hands in every aspect of, you know, from the major league level all the way down to the minor league level, and then sometimes in in scouting as well, you know, like amateur scouting. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Okay. So they're, they're definitely like Swiss Army Knife kind of guys. So they've been around the game. They know everything. They know, they'll, they'll know analytics. Um, they'll know some mechanics, um, yeah. and, and they'll know the game of baseball and how guys move. And they, they usually come up in the scouting yeah. department, sure. um, but then they, they move up pretty quick. Sure. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I've always been fascinated by that position as well. I have a friend who, um, happens to be the uh, head of advanced scouting for the Phillies and he would tell me about his, his job description i've always been very fascinated by it but i've always wondered too the ins and outs uh, this is something that i didn't completely know the ins and outs the everyday grind of what is an advanced scout and trying to find those little matchups that you might see in that upcoming series as you mentioned you know you may face it but see this is what i don't understand how do they figure out well you're probably going to face this guy or this guy or this guy i mean you don't you have to prepare for everybody or am i just being naive you do but you'll know like the you know, for the 
who are we using as our example? You know, the Angels maybe have a certain guy or two that come out first out of the bullpen, you know, okay. for matchups against left-handed hitters. Okay. You know, so who's facing, you know, I don't know. Gordon was still playing last year, right? Left-handed yeah. hitter. Like, you know, what are those matchups who you're typically going to see? Um, and then you use your coconut too. Like if I were in the shoes of the Royals, who would I want to face Gallo? Yeah. Right. Who matches up? And then, you know, you can, you can start to prepare for that. All right. Well, good stuff. Uh, by the way, MVPs were announced this week. Uh, any contention to who was uh, named the MVPs or are we, are we straight with that? Yeah, I was 60 games. Nobody cares. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Don't tell the do- hot for. I can get hot for 60 games. Don't tell the Dodgers that, though. Mm-hmm. I think DJ LeMay, who got robbed again, by the way. One of my favorite hitters in the Yeah, who wanted league. Abreu? Abreu won it. I love Abreu, too, so I'm not going to ever say anything bad about that guy. Freeman really, won it for really the Braves. Freeman for the Braves. Okay, so no contention yeah. with that. All right, well, no, we... I, 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 I think that, uh, you know, I think – Whatever. I, I, no, I don't think LeMahieu should have should have won because you know what? He gets pretty good pitches to hit in that lineup. You know what I mean? There's a lot of He's guys. He's in the leadoff wanna... spot, though. Huh? He's in the leadoff spot. Right. So the last thing you want to do is walk him. He's got Voight behind him, usually. Yeah. But when he gets on, he, he can run. Good base runner. He's got speed. Yeah, but they're not going to walk him. They're not going to pitch around him. 2 1, he's going to get a fastball. 3 1, he's going to get a fastball. All right. Uh, yeah, I, I understand if that. Ju- but... If Judge is up, he's not going to get a 3 1 fastball. They're going to, oh, I walked him. So, LeMayhew, if he leaves, that's not a smart move. That's not a smart move. First of right. all, he was in Colorado. And listen, I love DJ LeMayhew. Like, I thought he was the most underrated Rocky that ever lived. Like, this dude just has hit, always hit. Okay. He's always hit. But he's, I mean, let's, let's see where he's hit. He's hit. In Colorado, which is a pretty good hitter's place, they typically have pretty good hitters in that lineup, right? I mean, you got Arenado, you got Story. Yeah. Uh, used to have Helton. You know, you have guys that can – That you got Charlie Blackman that hit, hit, hit. And then you go to New York, and it's like, holy cow, these guys really hit, and they hit for power. So he's going to get challenged in that lineup of those players, hitting in the top of – if he hit eighth or ninth, he wouldn't get those pitches, but he hits okay. first. Okay. So if, if you send him somewhere else, I know Toronto was thinking, of, I, I wouldn't go. I would stick I would stick where you're going to be successful. It's a good park for right-handed hitters that hit the ball the other way. You're in a quality lineup that's got hitters for days. Yeah, I wouldn't move. So I'd can I give, you, my, yeah, can I, can I you, give you some of his numbers here? Yeah. So so this 50 games this year, I don't know how much stock you put into it. He hit 364. Mm-hmm. What would that do you think over 100? Say he plays 150 games. Well, really? he's still going to hit 330. The guy can hit. Yeah. All right, 327 last year, 2019, 145 games. He slashed uh, 364, 421, 590. His isolated power this year, 226, way above average. His weighted on base, way above average this year and last year, 429 this year, 375 in 2019. Weighted runs created plus above average again, 136, 177, 2019, 2020, respectively. I don't know, man. I'm, I'm, he can flat out hit. Oh, oh, no, no. I know he can flat out hit. What I'm saying is don't go anywhere else. Don't go to Florida. Don't go to San Francisco. Yeah. 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 Are, they think, are the Giants thinking about signing him? I haven't. No, read it. I'm just saying, stay in New York. That's okay, it. stay in New York. What was his qualifying offer? Eighteen point whatever seven. But six? I think he's worth more than that. A lot more. I, I'm saying I'm going three over seventy five. Wow. Okay. He's thirty two. Right. I'm three going over. no more than three. If Donaldson, if Donaldson got that kind of money from the Twins, then I Lemayhu deserves that kind of money. You're putting your thumb down. Why? Why? No, LeMayhew. LeMayhew had money. Donaldson, that, that, I don't know how he got that deal, but whatever. LeMayhew has better bat to ball skills and more power. He didn't get hurt every three days either. That's true, too. My God. I, don't, I, I mean, he. I'm just saying when that. He, when Donaldson's right, he's right. 
Yeah, right? but when he's you wrong, know, he's, he's very wrong. I think we yeah, because he doesn't play. Because <laughs> he, he gets he gets <laughs> hurt, you know. He gets hurt every other week. Yeah. Yeah, Lemayhu, three years, but the the Yankee, yeah, I, I could see that. I was thinking more in the three years, sixty, two years, three years, three over sixty to seventy million. Yeah, that's fair, especially in today's climate, today's times. But I would take the New York discount. Okay. All right. Fair enough. It's to, good to, to stay there. To stay there. He is a good. Uh, uh, he's kind of like the San Diego discount. But he is a good player. I'm sorry. He's one of my favorite players in the league right now. So good. He I, he can play anywhere in the infield. Ugh. The problem is the Yankees need a shortstop. So you don't think Glaber can get it done at short? No, okay. he can't get. He might be able to get it done at, at short, but he doesn't hit for some reason when he plays at short either. Although that's another. I mean, he's had a. His, I didn't watch a lot of baseball this year until the playoffs, and holy cow, his swing was all like, off out of sorts compared to where I saw him two years earlier. I remember seeing him when he first came up. I'm like, dude, that's a beautiful swing plane. Yeah. I saw him last year, and he was so steep. Like, there's no way he's going to, like, do anything but top a ball to left and flare out to right. So he needs to figure that out. Um, so that's that's the thing with, you know, uh, LeMahieu is, the, you know, you, Torres really needs to be a second baseman. Yeah. Well, you move DJ LeMahieu to third. You could move him to third. Yeah. You got a pretty good third baseman, too. Rochelle is a pretty good hitter. And he can pick it. Well, you, yeah, if you can tough. hit, you got to find you got to find a place, right? That's why we yeah, have yeah. all these scouts and analytics in the part in these baseball operations. That's departments. right, that's right. Not us. Well, before we get into, it should be us, though. Quite frankly, and before we get into our uh, our topic today, uh, let's talk a little bit about the uh, Epstein. We haven't talked about this in a while. The Epstein Online Hitting Academy. Mm-hmm. We haven't talked about that in a pretty long time. We need to. Actually. We need to. We need to talk about it. Let's let's do it. What's going on with the Epstein Online Hitting Academy right now? Uh, anything new? Any new features on the website where hitters can get better remotely? <laughs> Give me a we face like, always, uh-oh. We can always get better remotely. So, yeah, I mean, that's what I did this morning before we jumped on. I have a – who did I have? I had a player – oh, he's got such good rhythm from Florida, from North Florida. Mm-hmm. University um, of – Anthony, no, no, 14, no, he might not even be 14. He looks like a 14-year-old, but he, like, he goes 8 for 10 every tournament. I mean, this kid can absolutely hit. And he's a genius. Like, no joke genius. Like, I think Anthony missed one question on his math SAT when he was, like, I think we've talked. I think we've talked about this before. Yeah, so Anthony, boom, you know, he he looked good today. And then there's a girl, Brooke. We looked at Brooke today. Um, I don't know where she's from, but she's going to play D1 college softball. She's a stud. And, you know, sometimes she gets a little flat with her swing. So the beauty, again, about the online academy is she was going really good. Like, we made a big change. And then all of a sudden, she sent swings today, which is about two weeks later. And she was too flat. She said she's been struggling. So I gave her one little cue, boom, and she's going to probably go out today and get three hits. So the beauty of the academy in the beginning is building a swing, right? Making sure our mechanics are right. And then the beauty of the academy after our mechanics are right or, you know, having somebody that's knowledgeable with the swing that can tell you, oh, we need to do this, this, and this, and then boom, that slump ends. So it's kind of like me being your personal hitting coach. Online. Remotely. Online. It, That's what it, it takes you, you know, dad takes a video from the game. You upload it. That night, boom. Coach Yep takes a look. Says you need to do this, that, and the other. All of a sudden, exactly. you make $25 million a year over three years. That's right. Okay. And you, yes, you, and you don't it. forget it. You don't forget about Coach Yep. Who no. helped you along that process 10 years earlier. You That's say, true. you know what? That guy deserves like a Rolex or something. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so for more information, log on to EpsteinHitting.com to learn more about Epstein Online Hitting Academy. Very good. All right, be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast. Uh, we're on social media at Jim Tara at Epstein Hitting. I may be on that parlor app one day. Who knows? Um, and check out our YouTube page as well. Uh yeah, the uh, the lab Epstein hitting YouTube page with archived episodes and clips. So let's break into today's main topic. It's our player development series, revisiting that volume four. And we're talking today about different contact points for different locations. Uh, so I'll just ask you straight out, which locations are the toughest to consistently barrel up in today's game? And we're talking from 
collegiate level all the way up? Good question, because you threw in today's game, right, which might be a little bit different than it was in the, the 1950s sure. or 20s or 30s. That was a more of a high ball league. Guys were, were used to hitting that. Uh, today, high spin rate fastballs, you know. Mm. And we saw, it, we saw it during the series and the playoffs, you know. Uh, velocity, you know, everybody's got velocity now. And everybody has velocity coming out of the pen. Yeah. And nobody's throwing where they're losing velocity. So starters that, you know, start the game throwing 95, 96, 97, or Bueller 99, are still throwing that in the fifth and sixth innings. And if they drop off a tick or two, then they're gone, right? Then we bring in somebody else. So we're seeing velocity. We're seeing nasty stuff. Velocity typically lives up. You know, when guys throw hard, it's hard to catch up to pitches up. You couple that with, you know, players that um, are trying to elevate balls, right? They're trying to get their barrel underneath pitches. And, and for the last 10 years, yeah, they've been trying to elevate low pitches, sinkers, sliders. Now, all of a sudden, you throw something that doesn't sink or slide as often, and it makes it, it, makes it more difficult. So, um, you know, definitely that's the, that's the great equalizer right now is, is the high fastball. I'm not sure that really answers our question about pitch locations. Um, in terms of contact points, because whether it's high or low, you know, it's more in or out, which changes, you know, contact points, right? We have to let balls travel or hit them more out in front. But, you know, typically the the hardest pitch to hit for players, you know, aside from that is going to be the pitch farthest away from us, farthest away from our eyes. So low and away, right? That pitch, we have to reach our arms a little bit. We have to tilt our body in a little bit. And so when pitchers are good and they can, they can throw and get guys looking down and away where they're kind of leaning out over home plate. They're dropping their barrel to cover that pitch. And then all of a sudden you can throw something with some, you know, with some velo 180 degrees from that. That's what makes, that's what makes hitting so difficult is when yeah. pitchers have command, everybody's got velocity now, but I'm telling you guys that can set up and smart catchers with smart pitchers that can set up hitters and, and move their eyes around the strike zone between different pitches, those are the guys that are really tough. So let's picture, uh, by the way, uh, that whole uh, idea of letting the ball get deep minus outside pitches, that's kind of a bullshit term at this point, right? I mean, we see so many, <laughs> we see so many times where, where guys are hitting balls out in front, and, and you mentioned yeah. you do on this show trying to hit the, the baseball out in front rather than letting it get deep, which unless it's an mm-hmm. outside pitch, it's, it's kind of non-existent at this point. Is that, am I right about that? It's how you it's how you hit the ball out in front, yeah. So you want to hit a ball out in front, but if you jump to get it, it doesn't work. So I mean, let's talk about guys that that don't jump. So for instance, I had a I got to meet a, a great great kid. Uh, his name's L.J. Hatch. He plays in the Rockies organization. L.J. is a defensive specialist. Okay. Um, Self admitted, I go to every level because I can play defense. And I probably should. Did I tell you what organization he was in? Rockies. Okay. I was hoping I didn't. Anyway, <laughs> so LJ comes out with a, a good friend of mine and a longtime student from Kansas City. And, um, you know, he's like, yeah, I just, I don't know. I just don't hit. You know, I'm not, I'm not a hitter, right? Yeah. And so we look at his swing and I'm like, well, you have really good hands. He's like, yeah, yeah, I can, you know, hit a ball to right, hit a ball to left, hit a ball high, hit a ball low. I mean, really good hand path. But his legs, like his front leg doesn't even straighten. Yeah. You know, he hits with a bent front leg. And I'm like, have they ever, he's like, oh man, everybody in the organization, yeah, you don't use your legs. You really need to use your legs more. You need to get in your legs more. Anyway, it took uh, one day to get LJ into his legs. And then it took another day to get him into his legs, using his legs properly off of velocity. Okay. So not just front toss. I mean, you know, he's a pro player. You can tell him to do something in front toss. But he was able to do that in, in 48 hours, which was unbelievable to me. And that front leg never broke down. He started to sit back and everything worked. Well, the problem is he used to take his upper body to get to that pitch out in front. Like not his barrel in his hands. He would take his whole body to get to it. As soon as that happened, his front leg would break down. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, he was a guy where like, you got to let that ball get deep. Mm-hmm. Even though you're pulling it, you got to let it get deep so that it makes your body sit back more because as soon as it's out in front, you know, you'll get your chest forward. So yes, we, we don't want to let balls get too deep. 
Okay, so you want that timing window to be, you know, and everybody's a little bit different here depending on mechanics, but, you know, instead of hitting the inside pitch at one spot and then hitting the outside pitch, say, three feet deeper, three feet, holy cow, 36 inches, you know, that's like 12 miles an hour off a pitch. Mm -hmm. But if you can shrink 36 inches to, say, 18 inches between hitting an inside pitch out in front and an outside pitch a little bit deeper, yes, it's deeper, but it's not that deep. Okay, so... Those are the kind of things, but we have to get a player to use their body correctly. So in order to do that, you may have to tell them, hey, try to let it travel a little bit more and then sit back more. So, so we're letting it travel, yet we're still hitting it out in front. I guess that's the best way to say it. It's a very complex thing to, to, to learn, but when players get it, they feel like they have all the time in the world, yet they're still hitting balls out in front of their front foot. Yeah. So, so yes, we absolutely, you know, if you tell a kid, hey, let it get deep, you know, that's if if he's setting up a tee and he's had every hitting everything behind his front foot, you're killing that player because yeah. you have to you have to have a mechanical breakdown in order to do that to hit that pitch. But if you're letting him, if you're telling that player, hey, let it get deep because their upper body is hunching forward, then it's a bad thing. So the best thing to do is join the Epstein Online Academy for coach Jeff to be able to tell you if you're doing that now, but you know, having someone say, okay, you're, you are hitting it out in front, but you're doing it the wrong way. Yeah. We have to let it travel. Yeah. But we have to let it travel in order to keep our body back. So let's discuss contact points. Let's picture a plate. You're, you're at the plate, right-handed batter. Let's discuss contact points for certain pitches east to west. So inside pitch, mm-hmm. and we've talked about this before, you're hitting it out on your, in front of your front foot. Uh, right. I mean, that's mm-hmm. yeah the center cut right down the middle a little bit maybe at your front toes right right and then of course you're letting the outside pitch get very deep but you're releasing the barrel early from the lag that you would for Correct. the inside pitch and the pitch right down the middle so that's if you're teaching younger kids not just I mean, because at this point i think college kids and pro players should know this already but if you're teaching this to high school kids and below the, that's kind of the the base of the house if you will in in certain contact mm-hmm. points and being successful yeah i mean i don't i don't ever take anything for granted with what people know and what they what they don't know yeah. you know um depends on how how much your coaches really study yeah. but yes i would say you know if i were setting up a t- now again this has to do with how wide a player is too so that's why i i i have to look you know i have to kind of see but yeah. if a player's launch position when they stride you know, after they stride and they plant their front heel, that width, if that width is wide enough, okay, so if their inseam is 30 inches and that width is like 33 inches, then I would say that's standard, okay? So some people stride and they're wider than that. That ratio is wider. Some people stride and the ratio is narrower. So that changes contact points. So a player that's really wide, for instance, like uh, Tatis gets pretty wide. Okay. He's are you talking, just a, sorry, I'm sorry. Are you talking wide as in stride or step? As in stride length. Okay, all right. So at launch, after the stride, whether you start like Bellinger mm-hmm. and then you stride out. Okay, so that yeah. distance when you, you've already taken your stride, that's what determines how far out in front. So if you're narrow – you're going to hit a ball further out in front of your front toes on an inside pitch because you still have to have distance from your chest to your hands, to mm-hmm. the barrel. If you're wider, like pool holes, that ball is probably going to be three inches further back. So it might be at your front toes or it might be even behind your front toes because your front leg is so far out in front of your body. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it is somewhat dynamic depending on the player and how wide they get okay so it's not you know i can do cookie cutter if i you know if i'm marking up a video and i can tell them here but somebody like bellinger hitting it out in front is going to be different than somebody like tatis because their their width when they're done striding is so different okay so tatis is going to look like he's letting the ball get deeper because his left leg is his stride leg is so far out in front of him where Bellinger's more upright, he doesn't get that front leg out, so it's going to look like he's hitting it more out in front, even though the distance from their, say, their sternum is exactly the same. Okay. Again, we're speaking just of fastballs right now. We'll get to other pitches in mm-hmm. just a second. But how do you, as much as you can tell me, how do you 
we don't often go into drills on the show, but but mm-hmm. how do you tailor drills then to guys who have different or girls who have different strides to trying to get them to understand contact points in their swing? Yeah, so typically it's, you know, I, if I'm working with them, I can see them, right? So I kind of sure. know what their stride is like. So I'll set a ball up on, you know, we'll say it's a normal person that has a normal, a normal stride. Mm-hmm. And that stride like being a couple inches longer than their, their base being a couple inches longer than their inseam. Okay, so if, so okay, you know, so, if you have a, so for you, so say you're hitting, right? And you have a 32 inch inseam. When you're done striding, a 34-inch bat should fit between your arches. Sure. Okay? So we'll say we're kind of in that range. If that's the case, I'll set up the inside corner. You know, we could mark the inside, the inside corner to be about two inches in front of their front toes when they're done striding. So I'd mark it with something. Tape, right. chalk, a ball, whatever it is. I'd, I'd mark that so I have to say... And then I would have them stride to that same position. And then I would mark on the outside corner perpendicular to their like front shin. And then I'd mark that for the outside pitch. And then I would draw a line between those two, whatever that angle is, a diagonal, right? Connecting those. And then I would move that T, you know, on that diagonal. That's a good place to start. Okay. But, the better you release the barrel out towards the opposite field on outside pitches, the more you can possibly hit that ball out in front and drive it that way. Okay? Makes sense. Yeah. But, it, but yeah. it definitely gives you a good place to go where it says, wow, you know, that pitch on the outer third, not on the corner, but the outer third, you know, maybe I shouldn't hit that distort straight away right field. Right. You know, I can throw that barrel and launch that thing into center field or right center field. Yeah. Um, but, but that's definitely a good baseline. Do you ever do uh, side front toss? Is that something mm-hmm. that can be put into play? So if you're setting yeah. up side front toss, if you're going for the inside pitch on that contact point, you're setting it up for your right-handed batter. You're setting it up off center to the right side of the batting cage, we'll say, and then opposite effect for an outside pitch, setting up to the left side of the cage, correct? Yeah, usually I'll do it with guys that pull off. You know, okay. guys that, that tend to cut across balls, mm-hmm. so they slice balls to the opposite field. Mm-hmm. I'll essentially throw the ball, if they're a right-handed hitter, I'll scoot the, the cage all the way over, and I'll throw the ball essentially from where the shortstop would be playing. So yeah. it's like, you know, crossing home plate, so he has to really stay on that ball to hit it that way. Right, that's outside pitch, obviously, yeah. For outside pitch, yeah. I won't do it as much for inside pitches. Um, but you could go the other way. You know, it would be if that same right-handed hitter was hitting, you would pretend it was like Josh Hader throwing an inside fastball to him, coming from way out that way, coming into the batter. Yeah. And you got to try to, you know, you got to try to clear to, to, to hit that. So, yes, there, there's a purpose. I, I would say 95% of the time I'm using that on players to get them to extend through the opposite field so they don't over-rotate and spin off balls. Okay. So that, yeah. would you say that's better than the T or, or is it, are you just starting with the T first? Starting with the T first for, okay. for them to understand it. Okay. Yes. And, 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 you know, I just had certification training here was a month ago, mm-hmm. three, four weeks ago. And we talk a lot, a lot about the transition from hitting a stationary object to you know, hitting a live pitch to the opposite field, right? That's kind of like the progression. We start here hitting a punching bag and we finish here. Mm -hmm. And if you build mechanics the right way, which is what I try to do early on with players when I'm changing them Mm -hmm. and what my instructors are doing um, or the online academy drills, you know, those people that I'm sure a lot of those people are listening to this and they know those basic drills that I still have in their lesson plan in the beginning. Yeah. Once you get the swing where it needs to be, making those adjustments to go the other way are very simple. But if you just get a player to come in, and sometimes we see this at the lab, right? Somebody just joins a membership, right? We have players that have been in the training for six, seven months. Now, all of a sudden, we got a new kid that jumps in whose mechanics aren't where they need to be yet. And we have breaking balls set up on the outside part of the plate, and they have no chance because they, they don't have the foundation to get to that pitch. And then we have to kind of catch them up a little bit. But um, that's how it is. You just start slow. You start easy. You get them to understand it. You get the path working right. More than anything, you get the path working right. Then after the path is working right, you can cover both sides of the strike zone and up and down. 
Then once you can do that, now we can add some juice. Mm -hmm. Now we can get into our legs more. Now we can build strength. We can build explosiveness. But none of that works if a path isn't built in. You know, okay, the swing you plane has issues. I'm glad you mentioned that. How does path relate to contact points and being successful on different contact points? Yeah, if you – I always liken it to um, juggling. So if you have one swing for the outside pitch – and then you have, because your mechanics aren't good, like, you know, on an outside pitch, you know, you have to, you know, cast. And then an inside pitch, you try to bat drag to try to get your barrel down and in, you know, whatever. So you have two variables, right? So you have two different swings, but now all of a sudden you're covering three different pitches. So two times three is six. Now you're trying to juggle six chainsaws. Well, we want or balls, right? We're juggling six things. Good luck with that, right? But now if I have one swing, yeah. Right. That can cover inside and outside. And one times two is two. Well, I can juggle two balls. That's a piece of cake. I can juggle two balls in I, one hand. I, that's easy, though. Three right. is easy, too. I can do four. Go ahead. It, well, you can. That's because you grew up in the circus, you little freak. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, oh, no, you I creep. Mean, you, well, you know, the little carnies, you know, you live in the trailers. And, yeah. Yeah, the circus is a weird, weird place. But, yeah, it's it, it's when you have a good first move, and we spend so much time on launched what we call short approach, you know, yeah. heel plant to when we start to rotate. If you're good there, then all it is is extending to the outside pitch. But if something goes wrong there, if we drop the bat head, there was a kid who wrote me this morning, you know, his, his grandfather, he's a little guy, right, that's at the lab, and he drops his barrel below his hands, like in his stride, you know, I mean, it does, you know, how do we fix that? Well, if you have that move, there's no way I can teach you how to get to the inside pitch and the outside pitch consistently. Like we have to fix that move right now. And if we can get him to his short approach where that barrel's still up and his armpit's still open, now all of a sudden we can, we can get to all those other pitches. So mechanics comes first to get to those pitches. When yeah. your mechanics are pretty good, now all of a sudden we can, you know, we can work. And, and that's why I don't work pitch locations probably until I've worked with, you know, if I have a, just a, your standard 13-year-old, standard 12-year-old that has a mechanical issue, we're going to work mechanics for like four hours. Yeah. Three hours. Mm -hmm. And they're going to work that on their own. Yeah. Then we can move on. For instance, we had, you know, when LJ was here, you know, professional guy, I took, I mean, this is the difference between, you know, instructors. I, I videoed his swing. And I said, wow, your upper body looks, your hand path looks great. I'm not going to have you work on tipping the barrel or snapping it or whatever the hell everybody's concerned about now, right? It yeah. was like, boom, I, my eyes saw one thing. Yeah. And that was his front hip and his front knee, and it was causing a drift. So yeah. I just said, heck with anything with your hands. Let's attack this. We were able to do it in a short amount of time. And then his upper body still played. Yeah. I wrote down, I, wasn't, yeah. I wrote down next week, possibly uh, talking as much as you can tell us talking mm -hmm. about maybe opening the show with how you go about in order your checkpoints of how you go about developing a hitter, because there's so many elements to hitting and you sometimes have to put that into order and, and not go out of order to where you might mess a hitter up or capitalize on trying to capitalize on something that they already do really well. Without well, you just waste, strengths. you just waste time. Right, exactly. You waste time. If you start off the wrong way on the wrong thing, you're wasting time with that yeah. player. Yeah. And, and, and you're just spinning wheels, and then it's like, oh, now we got to go back and address this. Mm -hmm. And you have to have the, the right eye and the right experience to know, if I fix this, this is the glaring, most important thing that needs to be fixed. If I fix this, you know what? The residual effect is going to be that this gets better. Yeah. And now I don't need to fix, quote, this. I'm going to fix, you know, the main thing in hopes that the other part gets better. And then if it doesn't, then I can address that later. But, yeah, I mean, it is. It's – you got you to gotta know what you're doing. It's yeah. kind of like you're a mechanic, right, at a, at a car. If you're like, I don't know what it is. If you right. start playing around, you're going to ruin that engine. Yeah. But if you plug it into the freaking computer now and it says, oh, you need to do this, this, and this, you're like, okay. I'm a big we don't, we don't have a computer. We don't have a computer for mechanics yet. 
I'm a big uh, I'm a big '90s uh, television show guy. Seinfeld. And mm-hmm. Everybody loves Raymond. And what you just said there mm-hmm. reminds me of one of the later episodes and one of the later seasons. And everybody loves Raymond, where Frank Ray's father takes apart the washing machine without knowing how to really what the problem was. And he takes <laughs> what, takes out a part and <laughs> he says, "Well, here your problem is this won't go back in." It's kind of like a hitter there. Problem is, the problem is you, you you can hit this pitch, but <laughs> that's right. Your your something's off. That's right. Yeah. yeah, and 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 you can and players get into that, you know, typhoon where it, all of a sudden it's like, where did I start? Like yeah. I, all I wanted to do was work on my stride. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. And now all of a sudden I'm worried about the angle of the the bat during the stride or the angle of the bat, you know, here. And it's like you don't need to worry about that. Yeah. I have here. Uh, I have written on my my card here that we have to get to. Um, we have to get to breaking balls, contact points for breaking balls, change ups. Um, we can throw in sinkers there, sliders. Uh, so we'll start with with change ups because that's sort of the second most pitch that's thrown throughout baseball nowadays. Uh, what are the contact points like for? for change-ups? Uh, how do you establish good contact, consistent contact points that you can be successful on that pitch? You, you know, pitch-wise, pitch, pitch wise, it's, you know, we don't have to worry about what pitch, you know, if it's a slider or a change-up or a fastball. The pitch location is still going to be if you're, if you're looking for your ideal place to make contact. So if I'm looking for a change-up, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, if it counts – Two and oh, I pull a fastball foul. Okay, I'm going to get a changeup on the next pitch. If I'm looking for a changeup, I'm still trying to hit that changeup in my wheelhouse. If it's down the middle, I'm trying to hit it at my front toes. Sure. So the contact point's going to be the same. Now, sometimes they're dropping more, so your swing plane may have to be slightly different. Yeah. You know, on a breaking ball that's dropping 10 degrees versus a fastball that's dropping four or five degrees. Um, but as far as speed, you, you want to – I shouldn't say you want – if you're making adjustments, you're going to be able to hit the change up further out in front. Okay. okay. So if I'm looking for a, fa- say I'm in a fastball count, say it's two, two, the guy throws 96. Okay. Like I'm, I can't, I can't cheat off speed off 96. Okay. Yeah. So I'm looking for a fastball. I might be telling myself, look for a fastball away. So I'm letting it get deeper. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I got to buy a little time. Then if it's a change up, and I'm a little early, if I have good mechanics and good extension, I can still get to it without being, I'm still going to be fooled but I'm not going to miss it and be fooled. Where if I'm looking for a fastball in and cheating for 96 out in front of my front toes and that player throws a changeup, the pitcher throws a changeup, I really have no chance. Yeah. Of course, if I'm looking middle away and he throws 96 under my hands, I'm probably, I mean, the best I can do is fight that off, right? And maybe foul yeah. it off or take yeah. it if it's too far inside. So yeah, uh, different speed pitches. Uh, I'm not now, I mean, if we get the robo zone at some point and the robo zone kills that curveball that just catches the very front of home plate and then dips into the dirt, you know, yeah. then we might have to start making adjustments to that. Yeah. Um, but at this point, you know, fastballs and, and sliders, I'm, I'm more concerned with pitch location versus pitch speed or shape. Um, I will say that as a hitter, if, if the pitch is slower, I'm going to tell myself to try to let it get deeper. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so if yeah. I'm early and I'm in trouble, I might start looking for curveballs away, even if even in fastball counts. If I'm jumpy, if I'm early in fastball counts, I might trick myself and say, hey, pretend it's a curveball away. I got to let sure. it get behind my front foot mm-hmm. and then just to kind of help my time. Okay. Um, so before we move on to our listener question, just to wrap up this week's topic, do we miss anything on contact points that I failed to ask or failed to address? You know, the, the big thing with contact points is practice them all. Mm-hmm. Practice up, practice down, practice in, practice out. Find out where you're the best. Mm-hmm. You know, get a pocket radar. Get a, get a uh, you know, use a hit track. See where your, your bat speed is the best. And know that when the ball's middle away, it's going to come off the bat three or four miles an hour less than if the ball's middle in. Yeah. Okay? And if it doesn't, then you got a problem with your swing on pitches middle in. Yeah. So, and know what you're good at. Look, I, I, I know I was not good at blowing away. So I tried to just, just black out, blowing away until I had two strikes. Yeah. If it was in that window, I was going to take it. 
Yeah. And if the pitcher threw three balls low and away, I was going to lose. Yeah. You know, that's just yeah. kind of how it was. So know what you're good at. Some players are better middle away, and that's what they look for. So know what you're good at. Practice everything. High, low, in, out, fast, slow. Um, be a hitter. Don't necessarily be a slave to a certain drill. Makes sense. Okay. All right. Very good this week. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast. Again, new episodes every Monday at 9 a.m. Check out our YouTube page, The Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast, for clips and previous archived episodes. Um, at Epstein Hitting, at Jim Tara on Twitter and social media and Instagram. You can reach out to us there as well for topic ideas. And don't forget, you can reach out for with your questions um, and topic ideas or, you know, compliments or complaints, whatever. Jimbo Podcast 21 at gmail.com. We haven't gotten any complaints yet. So guess we're doing something right no maybe we're not maybe we need we need to take a, a harder stance maybe oh uh, well what do we take a harder stance on there's so many things in today's world you can take a hard stance on mm, geez where do i start yeah let's not open that can of worms all right well let's uh let's get to our listener question here it comes to us via jimbo podcast 21 at gmail.com and it's from brandon from orange new jersey we had uh, somebody from Orange, New York, yeah. last week um, email us. This is from Orange, New Jersey, Northern. I think Orange. it's Orange. It's not Orange. It's Orange. That's how my dad would say it. Orange. It's, how do you say Florida? Florida. It's Florida. A lot of people from the north say Florida. Florida. It's not Florida. Florida. It's Florida. Florida. <laughs> That's what you say. I I say Florida. <laughs> I I am I have great dic- dictation. Yeah, you have to. Uh, this is, he's from Brandon is from orange Brandon reach out to us again then and, and clarify our how do you say orange New Jersey uh, there's this only is actually, certain words my dad held on to from his time in New York and orange is one of them did he uh did he do I didn't I didn't know that about your dad did he ever roll his um his r's or his a's with his r's do you know what I'm talking what about means. like I want a piece of um a pizza no no I always find no, annoying. that's very annoying to me that's like Brit. That's uh, British, right? No, no, no. That, you hear New Yorkers? They'll they'll say, um, "Hey, what do you pizza? what do you doing? You want to get some pizza today?" And no, I, I will get a yeah. slice of pizza, not pizza. Yeah. It's very annoying. Yeah. Yeah. It's like when people from Philadelphia say "water" instead of "water." It's water. Sure do. All right. Um, this is actually a great question, though. Uh, he asks, "Hey, Jim, I was hoping you could ask Jake this question on the next episode of your show." As a weekly listener, I understand the questions you get are about hitting, but I want to ask something separate. My son is 10 years old, and he keeps preaching. I keep preaching to him to hit the target when he's playing catch. Based off Jake's extensive background from his playing days and now coaching, how can I teach my son to get better at playing catch? It seems like it's often an overlooked aspect of being a good player. Thanks, Brandon. I completely agree. If you want to yeah. be a great ball player, you got to be great at throwing and catching, and it's so overlooked. Oh, my God. It's so overlooked. Great question. And you're exactly right. Like, games are won and lost with the team that plays catch the best. It's just the way it is. Like, you yeah. don't make errors. Yeah. You can play catch. You're gonna you hit cutoff men. It, it's uh, so. I mean, one of the things that uh, that I do, and it drives me crazy when players don't, um, is if a player makes a bad throw, they have to go run and get the ball. Right. So if I'm playing catch with my kid, and she, and and she doesn't hit me in the chest or around the chest, mm-hmm. I let it go past me, and she's got to bust her hump to go get it. Mm-hmm. Run back, get the ball, and then make another good throw. So that's step number one. Like, I, if somebody makes a bad – and people are going to make bad throws. If you have your team lined up and they're playing catch and somebody throws a ball over their teammate's head, that person's got to run and go get it. So it starts there. But, you know, I would say that the point game and the chess game is still the best. You know, start 20 feet apart, 10 feet apart. You know, first one to 10 wins. You know, if you can hit the glove without, without moving, right? Right at the chest, right at the chin – that area it starts there we also start I always start with progression so we will do uh, and and again she's 10 right didn't he say his son's 10 he said his son yes 10 years old yeah 10 years old so we'll start and we'll do um, where our feet are planted and we'll Mm -hmm. turn our shoulders back and then we'll make a throw only about maybe 15 or 20 feet away at the most Okay. So we're just focusing on our turning our upper body and then boom, firing through to throw right through the chest. We'll do that 10 or 15 times. Then we'll scoot back and then we'll start using our legs. 
and then we'll kind of go from there. But we play a lot of the a lot of the point game, and then if they sure. if she makes a bad throw or anybody makes a bad throw, you got to run and go get it. You're not going to be rewarded for that bad throw. It's not funny to make a bad throw. Yeah, and I'm not going to go get it for you. Right. I'm not going to go get it for you. Even right. though I should, it would, it would increase my energy and exercise level for the day. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do something else instead of running after the ball that my kid threw me. Right, right, right. <laughs> but it's so – it is really – I mean, and even you look at some – you can tell by, uh, like, say, a high school team when guys mm-hmm. are throwing balls over each other's heads or throwing it low. You can tell who's yeah. sloppy and who, who's not and who doesn't do the little things the right way, starting yeah. with watching a team and how a player, for example, if you're scouting a player, uh, whatever, how he has a, yeah. how he has catch, how plays catch. Yeah. And how he how he plays catch. And we'll do quick catch, same thing. It doesn't have to be from really far away, but we'll do quick catch just so she can kind of, like, understand that. What, what yeah. is too fast when I'm quick catching, you know, what is – if I get the ball out, I don't have, I don't get the handle on it. You know, it's okay to take an extra step or it's okay to pump. And um, it is, I mean, it is so important and set up games. I mean, if you have property, I don't Colorado where we live, it looks like California, you know, there's houses on top of each other, but you know, if you got an acre and you got a big tree, hang a tire from a tree and get a bucket of balls and just natural that thing. Right. Just see how many balls create a contest. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, get a pitch back with a square on it. And constantly, the pitch back's great. If you miss the square, where does the ball go? It doesn't go back to you. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yes, you know, it doesn't mean you got to throw a lot where you hurt your arm, but quality throws. Yeah. Every coach loves somebody that can hit a target. Well, great question, Brandon. Thank you very much for that. Next week, we are going back to our mechanical breakdown series, volume five, and we are discussing the swing and breaking it down. The swing of Pete. Rose and Ep, I have to ask you: Is Pete Rose a Hall of Famer? I'm really looking forward to your answer. Am I supposed next to tell week? You that? Next, next week. week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gotta dig some. I gotta go find me some Pete Rose video. Yes, I used to have some, but I'll get some. We're gonna answer That'll that question. Up. We're gonna answer that question next week, and we're gonna break down his swing, which would be a lot of fun. Hit the hit the great the hit king. I mean that he is one of the best hitters of all time, best contact hitters of all time. Right? Or am I? I think you're right. Okay. You're looking at me like, I mean, the, I mean, I don't know if, if Ichiro is the true hit king. Yeah. Not the right. true major league hit king, but maybe the world leader. He did play for 42 years. Well, we'll discuss that uh, next. We'll discuss all of that and break down in Pete Rose's swing next week. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast. Thank you for listening, and we will talk to you next week.